Hello and welcome back. I'm Chris and this is Curiously Polar. And with me today, Mario Aquarone. Buongiorno. Hello, Chris. Buongiorno. How are you doing up there in the in the cold north? Is it cold? Well, today, today it's not cold. Today it's uh, sunshine and fantastic. I mean, 25th of May, sunshine, 18 degrees. It's uh, beautiful. Uh, just for your information, on the 17th of May, Norway's National Day, it was sleeting here. So <gasps> we have had a... A uh, rapid warming of the of the temperatures. Yeah, <laughs> really nice, really we, nice. We we had that too here. I mean, it it went into into the thirty uh, low low high twenties, almost thirty degrees or uh, over thirty in some mm. German places here, and uh, and then we had uh, a couple of days of severe storms and huge band of thunderstorms mm. coming through, and now it's kind of back to. Lovely, normal, normalish for this time of year. So mm. big swings nice. here. Um, good to see <laughs> you again. Swings, we yes. haven't talked in a long time. Yeah, there have been a few uh, a few issues with uh, holidays <laughs> and things as usual. But uh, and, well, we, and we work call this as well, we but. call this life and life. Yes, exactly. In a way that but is just we are thing. here. <laughs> um, Okie dokie. We have a. A bunch of interesting short stories uh, regarding things in space. That's my that's my favorite topic. I'm really looking forward to talking with you about things that fly high above the Earth. Or exactly. Do they, do yeah. they fly? Yeah, they fly. They fly. Yeah, they I don't have they, they fly. fly. They, they fly orbit, very fast, actually. Yes, they are orbiting. I would like to talk a little bit uh, about a new uh, Arctic weather uh, satellite uh, system. And, uh, yeah, Arctic so that's uh, that's very interesting because you know the uh, when you look at Meteosat, for example, yeah, it's a an equatorial, it's a geostationary satellite, so it has to be on equatorial orbit. And Meteo it's... Meteosat, okay, so I remember mm. Meteosat being around for I don't know for almost ever, a long time. So, yeah, so long time. this is one single satellite, mm. and that is geostationary, which means it turns, mm. it rotates exactly with the Earth, and it looks at the mm. same side of the Earth all the time. Yeah, and uh, like when you when you have a, when you put up a satellite, of course, you put it to uh, uh, to the intended use, and of course, like if you have a satellite on a an equatorial orbit, you actually are looking down at a very populous place. If you're going towards the Arctic, there is less. Uh, there are fewer users, so it's very. It's it's not as important to get information about the Arctic, or it has been historically not as important. But mm -hmm. the Arctic is getting more and more uh, attention and interest, and uh, so for uh, looking at uh, what happens in the Arctic, you need satellites that are above the Arctic, so that you can look down directly at uh, things. You know. That's and the uh, geostationary conundrum. doesn't really work there, does it? No, it doesn't. And uh, and also like uh, the other way that is uh, usually used for satellites is a polar orbit. So you have satellites that come and pass over the pole. And of course you have to coordinate how the satellites are passing over the pole because you have too many they risk and they are, they are on the same kind of orb orbit. They come very close to each other mm -hmm. or even bang on each other. So it's Kind of like strange. And also, the more you go towards the pole, the more you have overlapping coverage. So it's not very economical, isn't it? And I also, I think I also read somewhere that it's more expensive to get satellites into, mm. a, pol into a polar orbit. So mm. um, because if you get them into a, a, an equatorial orbit, then you can use the rotation of the Earth to kind of get mm. up there easier, which is not possible if you go sideways. Exactly. And uh, yeah. so in any case, the uh, the parts that are important here are the parts that are tundra covered. And, and we're talking about uh, the tundra because it's a, a very important area for uh, the permafrost and therefore for uh, the regulation of the climate uh, uh, gas uh, methane, for example. Mm -hmm. They can be released with the thawing of the permafrost. So it's uh, it's quite interesting, the project here. And uh, it's a Swedish consortium that is uh, in teaming up with the uh, uh, with the European Space Agency. 
and uh, they are producing us a prototype of an Arctic weather satellite that is supposed to be part of a constellation of 16 small satellites. Hmm. And uh, they are in polar orbit and they gather weather data. So this is uh, something that should be ready in 2024 and then should be giving data about snow coverage, the color of the uh, of the tundra. And uh, that's uh, quite um, quite something also to give feedback data on the weather models on the climb on the and the the modeling of the weather that requires uh, surface data. And um, this is uh, also giving possibility of uh, uh, like with a better model to have uh, to have better weather forecast. And um, yeah, this is uh, quite uh, quite something. Uh, so we, we're talking. Of course, uh, uh, temperature, how many, how many humidity, satellites are we talking about 16, here? Is that sixteen. Sixteen. You said yeah, okay. When if the whole system is put up. Um, there are also other um, other satellites. The Canadian Space Agency is uh, approved uh, an Arctic observing mission that has uh, satellites in uh, a slightly slanted orbit, so a highly elliptical orbit, mm -hmm. and that will be directly above northern Canada, I mean the uh, the Arctic Canada areas when it passes there. So it will be gathering data directly above the land area of Canada. And of course, it would be uh, quite interesting to have that. So the, uh, these elliptical orbits, okay, what we're talking about, I think, is lower Earth orbit. So we're talking about mm -hmm. something that's in, I don't know, four, five, six hundred kilometers up there, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. elliptical means the Earth is going to rotate under it. So it will cover that area every, yeah. I don't know, couple of hours yeah. or something. And then Depend it'll... Yeah. It'll the Earth keeps rotating, so it, it gets a look at all those parts over time, and then mm -hmm. it yeah. uh, comes around pretty much. Exactly, and this is uh, this is uh, also like if if the plan goes uh, according to to what uh, was uh, asked for, they should have spectrometers, so they will not only have temperature and humidity, but they will also track uh, greenhouse gas emissions, mm, okay. and uh, and and also this is interesting. They will have a sensor the other way, so to look at what's coming out from outer space, so to look at the at the um, uh, space weather. So that uh, that is. Uh, also something that uh, is quite interesting, especially when our infrastructure, is, since our infrastructure is becoming more and more delicate to uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and the auroras might be uh, like uh, impairing it. And it, I think it also helps to have um, additional data looking in the other direction collected by the same vehicle at the same time because that will make it so much easier to correlate with any phenomena that are uh, that are um, seen on the earth side I guess yeah so well, this is uh, this is very interesting there is uh, more and more attention towards the Arctic there is more and more usage of the Arctic but also the strategic importance of the Arctic is uh, being recognized more and more so I think so, that uh, we'll see more of these uh, satellite uh, satellite so, articles in in this in this podcast. So so the 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 one consortium OHB Sweden AB is mm -hmm. the one that you wrote down here um mm -hmm. is that I mean, what 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 is their final purpose? Is that only science? Is that weather observations to make sure the the the, the big the big ships can pass? and stuff like it's, that is uh, that an economic yeah. an economic incentive because we're talking about a lot of money that goes into mm. these uh, things so I think uh, we are mostly looking at weather with this uh, constellation and uh, I mean the European Space Agency has also obligations towards the national states so there there is right. a, like a uh, both a weather and climate related interest in this okay. and uh, the weather is uh, mostly in this case, uh, for uh, infrastructure and transport. And uh, when we are passing over the Arctic, we also have to think that not only the Arctic opens up and so it's uh, uh, it's possible to pass by ship mm -hmm. and there is probably going to be an increase in ship's traffic, both uh, commercial uh, transport uh, of goods and persons uh, for tourism. 
military importance about this, okay. but it's also a place where uh, if you're going transcontinental with a flight, you're passing over the Arctic. So you'll have... Oh, that's uh, very true, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. so you need, uh, you need to know things that are happening there. And, uh, of course, uh, planes fly very high, but sometimes, uh, you know, if you have uh, an increase in thunderstorms, for example, further, further north, you need to know whether you have to fly a little bit higher for avoiding turbulence and other things so mm -hmm. okay so that's um that's quite a, quite a, an interesting state uh, um, interest or national interest with the commercial interest in the background as well all right yes but what um, is next on the list yeah. next on the list is that uh, by looking at satellite data uh, People uh, from uh, the UK mostly have looked at uh, what's happened in the Antarctica. Now we're going south and what happened in the Weddell Sea, especially to the east of the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, they wanted to check what was happening at uh, the uh, uh, change of the, of the millennium because uh, in the last two decades of the last millennium, we have had a breaking of the ice shelves. So the big life, uh, Larsen B and Larsen, Larsen A, Larsen B, all, the, all these big ice shelves have been broken and have drifted out to sea. And then they looked at what happened in the 21st century and I say like, wow, that's quite interesting that uh, if we have had the big ice shelf in the Larsen A in 95 and, and Larsen B in 2002 that broke out. Well, they saw that, of course, the, the ice shelves are, are smaller, but there is less of a breakage of the ice shelves in the, in the following two decades, the, uh, the last two decades. So what has happened? Um, since this is important to understand because uh, uh, the ice shelf actually acts as a cork, as a dam that stops the land glaciers to come into the Weddell Sea. So really? with the yes, the uh, the ice shelf is attached to the continent. Yes. So it it slows down the flow of ice from the land glacier into the sea, which is a major component of sea level rise due to climate warming, for example. Right. So, uh, so trying to understand what happened is very important. And they found out using at satellite data, and this is, this is, of course, like if you're talking from the 80s until now, they've looked at the roughness of the sea and the uh, weather circulation patterns. And they've seen that there's been a very big change in the prevalent winds and the prevalent circulation, low, low atmosphere circulation, which in the last two decades of the last millennium, so in the 20th century, we have had uh, the uh, uh, winds, prevailing winds coming from the west and therefore blowing the sea ice out of the, of the uh, Weddell Sea uh, more than what happened in the following two decades. In the last two decades, the weather are prevalent, prevail prevalently from the east and there have been a push of the ice towards the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, the presence of this sea ice has a dampening effect on the waves. And by dampening the waves, the stress on the shelf has been less in the last two decades, and therefore there has been less of breakage. Okay, this now I get it. I, th I thought in initially thought the presence of the sea ice would just... Um, that the sea ice would, would resist the, the glaciers flowing into the sea, but the sea ice can be pushed aside usually. So, yes. Um, but so, the, 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 so the, shel the shelf is, effect yeah. is interesting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so you, have, for, you have the continent with glaciers. Yeah. Then attached to the continent, you have a floating shelf. Yeah. So there's a flat sea uh, ice that has been uh, attached to the, uh, the continent. And then at the edge of the shelf, you can have either open sea or right. ice or sea ice. That is then uh, at that level there that we can get uh, a problem. And here uh, is a, it's a piece of news from Newcastle University uh, about uh, uh, a study 
that uh, saw some of their um, some of their uh, researchers uh, to be involved, and uh, it's it's quite interesting that uh, the sea ice is actually a stabilizing influence on the ice shelves, mm. and it's very important to understand for the future to predict the breakage of shelves to look at the prevailing winds and therefore on the sea ice that is around the shelves. Not not, not an, an easy thing to do, but uh, of course, like especially when we get new, better satellites, because these satellites that we saw that are going in the previous article going north, they are also going to be passing south. So they're going to be taking better weather data from the south as well. I find it fascinating that uh, mm. the, the, the amount of parameters that go into... The trying to model what is happening and uh th this feels like just just another big piece of the puzzle and uh probably not the last one but they are they are adding mm. more and more findings to to whatever they are modeling there to be able to i guess predict where this is going and well and, yeah uh, I mean, it's, it's always it's always uh best i mean for for most people it's best to know where we're going and uh, yes. like uh, if we are talking about uh, a, a catastrophic event uh, where the uh, a lot of the land ice goes into the sea there is going to be also a, a as a consequence a raise in sea level and a raise in sea level even of uh, a few centimeters is uh, is something that uh, a lot of uh, cities for example would be interested yes. to know a little bit beforehand than at the last minute. All right. Yeah. So that's uh, that was also, of course, like satellite related, and uh, and uh, then I'll just jump towards a, a very crazy, crazy project or crazy or quite a, a science fiction like project, which is about mitigating climate change, and. Um, and it's about sea ice and about ice in general, and how can one, uh, uh, like using geoengineering, stop or slow down the melting of the ice? Just put an entirely like a huge umbrella over the Arctic, out in outer space, and uh, will then shield the sun, and it won't be as warm. It's that easy. Yeah, except except that uh, like you don't count for the atmosphere because the umbrella could be also uh, like the clouds can be also called a kind of umbrella. We, we do have an umbrella. So, it's called the atmosphere, right? <laughs> yeah, it's called the atmosphere and it's called the clouds. And, and actually, when you got more clouds, you got a warmer atmosphere. Because uh, the, I thought, uh, I, I, thought you, you I solved it. I thought I solved yeah, it. Yeah, you thought you solved it, but you probably need to have an umbrella quite high up, and it needs to reflect the radiation from the sun away. So the polar night. We need another moon that always is in the same spot and shields. Yeah, the exactly, from, <laughs> shields from the, from the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, and um, well, this is uh, this is a project. I mean, this is uh, the the link that I that I showed uh, that I will uh, will have as a main link for the show notes is uh, the link of this project. And now, this project Arctic is ice project. Yes, it's called the Arctic Ice Project, and it's uh, in like it's a, quite a simple thing, you know, like glass. Glass is made of silicium. It's the one of the most abundant elements on Earth, and glass is pretty inert. We are not uh, like it, it has practically no additives, and you can make small beads. And uh, these small, small beads are how like how small are we talking? Yeah, we are talking about something like like a grain of sand, like a sub sub micrometer. Uh, okay, glass beads. sand. Okay, yeah, glass sand made of glass, but white, so reflecting. Mm -hmm. And of course, like there are methods of production of these glass beads that are making it like not too expensive to produce. But the important part is that the uh, what do they want to do with the glass? Just pour it out yeah, in the Arctic? Exactly. They would like to spread Maybe. it, spread these glass beads over the ice, and the glass beads would then be reflecting more of the lights. And you know, you have been. Uh, You've been in several of these uh, of these of our shows. Asked uh, what, if you remember what is albedo, and I remember that you now know what is albedo. It's 
The so reflectivity, the eh? how much sunlight yeah. gets reflected back. So, so white exactly. glass beads in the Arctic just cover everything, and then that'll increase yeah. albedo and uh, it'll cool down. Is that the idea? Yeah. The idea is exactly that. So you have s very small hollow glass microspheres that if you oh put them strategically in certain places in the Arctic, you can improve the reflectivity of the sea ice and therefore like keep the ice longer. And, and, and if the ice is there, it's not the open sea. The open sea is dark and it absorbs more heat. So uh, like... It it would be it, it sounds like a like a win win situation and and these are wow. hollow glass microspheres because they are um, there's a time material that is uh, stable and it's uh, safe like even if you ingested these they would not be giving you dangerous chemicals and they and are so floats. small that they would not uh, yeah well, yeah no well, it depends on on the size then there's air but inside then uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, but they are very, very small. Uh, so it really depends on how small they are. That's true. And uh, and if you think about sand, well, sand actually does go down. So it depends, uh, like, does it go down in the in the depth? So the the problem here, so and uh, yeah, and, and we have a little problem here is that the uh, local communities, and I think that I gave you a link to an article from the Anchorage, an Anchorage yeah, newspaper. Yeah, um, I have it open Didn't on the I? screen right now. Yeah, so the Anchorage Daily News reports of actually quite a lot of uh, skepticism in uh, uh, Alaska right. to this project. Because, uh, um, like, first of all, like it's uh, not tested before so we do not know what is what is hap going to happen isn't, here but then isn't sand isn't sand pretty much silica the thing that they want to make yes, these from yes, so so it yes. would be introducing a, a, a new a, a slightly different sand because it's brighter and yes. it reflects but i think that most people up there in Alaska, they are actually saying like, <laughs> how about somebody came into your garden and unloaded a large quantity of sand that then is, and then the sand can, can move away. It can be blown by the wind. And, uh, and, and so there is quite a, quite a lot of, uh, of, of resistance to this project among, especially among the people that are actually living in the Arctic. Uh, I mean, and, uh, I mean, they to could be, be exposed to that. To be honest, if if I had the choice between having someone unload a truck of uh, white sand, uh, silica sand, in my garden, uh, versus someone building, I don't know, a coal powered uh, power yes. plant or something, I, I, my choice would be very <laughs> clear. Or or, or does this, or does this turn into a NIMBY problem, not in my backyard, kind of? Thing. Well, yeah, the, the problem here is that you cannot do it anywhere else. I mean, this is only working when you are spreading the sand over the ice and, and keeping the ice uh, cool and mm. uh, and and uh, reducing the albedo that uh, that comes with, uh, with the oh, ice. And, and it's, also, it's also like styrofoam, right? It's beads, so it has, it has insulating properties as well, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm. uh, it's actually... Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it's it's beads, but it's it's mostly because when the ice gets thinner, it gets uh, darker. Yeah, what because you can see transparent. I mean, when the ice gets thinner, it gets more transparent, and then you can see the dark of the sea behind it. So if you cover this with with silica with these microspheres, it will still be whiter than if you didn't do it. But um, yeah, so uh, the, there are uh, quite, uh, quite a few that are concerned uh, about the animals, of course, and about how the, uh, I mean, it's more doubts about how, how, the, how is this all going to work. And, uh, and also one point that I'm thinking about, they were not uh, talking about it in this article from the Anchorage Daily News, but it's what if a lot of sand is then blown from the sea over to the land, and it actually does cover the tundra. I mean, well, we, all, we've seen this by, yeah. by the Sahara sand being blown around into like the exactly. Amazon rainforest and stuff. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking about because we were we were, we were looking a couple of episodes ago about the about the Sahara sand being able to cross uh, to come across yeah. from uh, uh, Africa to South America. So there are quite a lot of uh, long range transport. It depends really just on the strength of the winds and uh, and as the climate warms, we are going to get more extreme events with more storms and and like where is all this sand going? And if the sand goes over the tundra, it will keep it cooler, but it will also have a uh, an effect on the vegetation, and so, uh, and the vegetation actually absorbs carbon. <laughs> so the and, Arctic and Ice Project is is in a suggestion. This is a, a scientist suggestion that is not a. Th th yeah. There's no no real project there other than people thinking about what could be done or well I think or is there any you, action already? Well, they have been testing a few uh, a few small uh, tests in the in the in the sites, but I think that there are quite a a lot of uh, uh, I mean at least in the scientific advisory board there are pretty big professors uh, from uh, around the around the world, including Norway. Uh, there are uh, like quite big interests in in this in this project, and mm. it is a part of this thing that we call geoengineering. So engineering that serves a purpose that is global, like a carbon capture plant, like uh, right. the one in Iceland or other places, like uh, like modifying the reflectivity of areas by uh, like modifying the reflectivity of or the absorption of, of heat by towns by having more plants. But there are some things that are less invasive than others. And, and this is, seems to be quite something that needs to be, that needs to be thought through and tested. And uh, maybe, mm. uh, yeah, maybe it will work. Who knows? But uh, it is, uh, it is well, of course, very important to uh, keep the sea ice as much as possible. And, and, and uh, projects like this yeah. will, will at least pique people's imagination and they, they will keep mm. the discussion going. And uh, I think it's better to think about things and play with ideas uh, rather than not doing anything at this point. Yes, and uh, in general, I mean, it is interesting to look at projects that can mitigate the uh, climate change. So like these geoengineering projects is one part of the of the puzzle but the the main piece of the puzzle stays with reducing co2 emissions reducing gas uh, climate gases uh, emission as well as pollution in general but uh, it's we are talking about something that is a palliative is a cure and uh, as we know it's better to prevent than to cure if one can all right let's yes Let's keep looking at these things. Um, that is it for today. Thank you so much for bringing these things to our attention. Um, yeah, let's, You're let's very paint. Welcome. Let's paint the world white, and then the problems will yes. go away. Right, <laughs> big paintbrush. <laughs> yeah, big <Just>. whitewash. <laughs> yeah, better than greenwashing. <laughs> All right, we will be back soon with another episode. You can, of course, find us online at curiouslypolar.com and on the tweets and so on. See you then. Take care and bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>